Today we're going to look at the story of um, the destruction of the city of Jericho in the book of Joshua. Actually, we're going to mostly just summarize that part of it, and we're going to look at the immediate aftermath of the story involving a man, uh, a man, an Israelite man named Achan, who took some things from the city of Jericho, even though uh, everyone was supposed to leave everything there. They weren't supposed to take any any things for themselves. And we're going to look at this story from a post-colonial perspective. We've talked about co post-colonialism before, and uh, I want to give a little bit of a review of that. And uh, before I read uh, part of the passage in Joshua, I want to read uh, a little bit from our friend Cotton Mather, who uh, lived in the 17th century in New England. And I've already read a little bit of his, uh, his work before, where he tells a history of New England from, uh, from the perspective of the European settlers, uh, the Puritans. And uh, I talked about the fact that in one passage, actually more than one, he refers to the, uh, the Indians, the Native Americans, as Ammonites. And it's clear that he associates the uh, the English, the European settlers, as with the Israelites in the biblical story of Joshua, and the Indians, Native Americans, for the most part, he associates with the Canaanites, the native settlers. Um, I'm not going to reread that passage. I'm just going to read one sentence um, from the story about uh, it's about it leads into uh, an incident in history called King Philip's War, and this is what he says. So that now the war was begun by a fierce nation of Indians upon an honest, harmless, Christian generation of English who might very truly have said unto the aggressors, as it was of old said unto the Ammonites, I have not sinned against thee, but thou dost me wrong to war against me. Lord and judge be judged this day between us. I suspect that uh, King Philip, uh, who was uh, a Native American leader, and uh, those who were on his side would have taken issue with Cotton Mather's characterization of the war as completely unprovoked. I also want to read a little bit of um, this poem, The White Man's Burden, that I ask you to read. This is a poem by Rudyard Kipling, who was an Englishman uh, of the 19th century who was born in India, which at the time was a British colony. And he wrote this poem, uh, he very much came from an imperialist mindset, and he wrote this poem uh, shortly after the American takeover of the Philippines, after the Spanish-American War. And uh, I'm just going to read the first, uh, first stanza of it. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captive's need, to wait in heavy harness, on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. So Rudyard Kipling, I think in his own mind, was uh, being very generous. He's saying that the, the white man, that is the Europeans, have an obligation because they're so much smarter and so much wiser and have so much more technology. Um, they have an obligation to the people they conquer to actually raise their standards of living and to make them um, into a happier people. Um, they might have been happier if they hadn't been conquered, but that didn't seem to enter into Kipling's mind. There are some who interpret the poem in a different way, that say that uh, Kipling was actually um, being, mm, being ironic in what he says uh, in his, his poems. He's actually pointing out the problems with colonization. Well, that doesn't need to concern us here. Uh, the point is that he uses language that would have been very familiar to his readers, uh, who would have been predominantly English. And so now I want to read just a bit from Joshua chapter 7. The Israelites have um, conquered the city of Jericho. This is the first large city that they've conquered after they have entered the promised land at the beginning of the book of Joshua. And uh, following God's laws, um, they, as they understood it, uh, they destroyed the entire city of Jericho. They killed every man, woman, and child. 
in the city, all the animals, all everything was supposed to be burned um, and completely destroyed. However, as we find out in chapter 7, that didn't exactly happen. But the Israelites broke faith in regard to the devoted things. The devoted things is a, a translation of a Hebrew word that means things that were devoted to destruction. That is, things that were captured but should have been destroyed, not kept for somebody's benefit. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the Israelites. What happens next is the Israelites go out to fight another city in the vicinity, a city called Ai, and they think that it'll be a very easy conquest because it's a much smaller, has a much smaller population than Jericho. However, the inhabitants of Ai rout the Israelites in battle, and that could only have happened, they assume, if somebody had uh, violated the ban, they had violated God's law. So now verse 16 of chapter 7, Joshua rose early in the morning, <clears throat> and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken by Lot. <coughs> he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. He brought near the clan of the Zerahites, family by family, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household one by one, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him. Tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, It is true. I am the one who sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. They now lie hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites. They spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah with the silver, the mantle, and the bar of gold, with his sons and daughters, with his oxen, donkeys, and sheep, and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord is bringing trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him to death. They burned them with fire, cast stones on them, and raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. The, uh, therefore, that place to this day is called the Valley of Achor. So all of uh, Achan's, uh, Achan is killed, but so is uh, his wife, his children, his whole household, probably included servants. and. Um, so he is punished uh, for this sin against, uh, against God and uh, indirectly against the Israelites. So let's talk a little bit about post-colonial literature, and we'll talk about a post-colonial reading of this passage. Post-colonial literature, uh, as we've talked about before, arose in countries recently liberated from colonial rule, usually European rule. Uh, post-colonial theory examines ways in which Western culture imposed its values, categories, self-identity, and worldview on colonized peoples, and uh, the post-colonial literature seeks to recover pre-colonial or native ways of thinking. However, at the same time, um, post-colonial writers recognize that they can't uh, completely undo the past, they can't rewind to before the colonization, and many of the ideas and influences, thought, language, religion, culture, uh, from the colonizers has already infiltrated the, uh, the people. And so post-colonialism struggles with the native ideas and thoughts uh, in contrast to the colonial uh, ideas and thoughts and tries to figure out how to deal with those things. Now, post-colonial readings of the Bible involves such things as uh, examination of imperial power structures within ancient and classical world, for example, the Assyrian, Persian, and the Roman empires. Uh, it analyzes texts from the perspective of the colonized and oppressed peoples, for example, the Jews in the Persian or Seleucid periods uh, can analyze the parables of Jesus in the light of Roman imperial policies, things like that. Uh, so, 
post-colonial reading of this passage in Joshua and the previous chapter, chapter 6, which is the destruction of Jericho, um, can be done for a couple, from a couple of different perspectives that could both be post-colonial. Norman Gottwald is a uh, famous uh, Hebrew Bible scholar, and he proposes uh, his, his idea of the conquest of the Holy Land by the Israelites was that the Canaanite city-states uh, were, uh, were where wealth was concentrated and the Canaanite uh, city-states oppressed, <coughs> oppressed the people who lived in the surrounding countryside and villages, um, causing them to, forcing them to uh, support the, uh, the rich cities. Um, and uh, in Gottwald's view, the Israelites arose out of the um, out of the villages, the sur surrounding rural countryside. They were basically egalitarian freedom fighters, um, and so the Israelites then would be victims in uh, of colonialism uh, of the Canaanites. Now, another way to look at this from a different perspective is to take the biblical story at face value. Uh, the biblical story says the Israelites had an army of 600,000 men. That would have been much larger than any Canaanite force in the area. And from that perspective, uh, the Israelites were the invaders. They were the colonizers. And the Canaanites then would have been, could have been viewed as um, uh, those who were, who were oppressed or those who were colonized by the Israelites. So the city of Jericho was put under the ban or devoted to Yahweh for destruction. And... Uh, these, the items that were in, uh, in Jericho had to be destroyed as well as all the people. And according to the uh, biblical text, all of the people in Jericho were, in fact, slaughtered. So this raises, uh, certainly raises some questions from a post-colonial perspective. If this is taken as a model for what colonization should be like, um, what, uh, what kind of perspective might those who are on the other side, those who were colonized, how might they feel about this passage of Scripture? So I want you to look at the questions that are on the class website and uh, discuss them in your groups, and we will come back and talk about them all together at the end of class. Thanks.